right. I believe this means we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasions, welcome to another Monday morning tech chat show on the SGGQA podcast channel. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, also known as Some Gadget Guy, the SGG of this terribly named podcast series. And the QA, of course, stands for question and answer, as I like to make this an interactive conversation about the top tech stories and the top tech follow-ups facing our industry today. And I'm already seeing a wonderful live chat to jump into JMX Warrior, Heike, Matt Tyler, Boeing by Three-Legged Couch, uh i'm missing a few dank pikmin matt tyler did i say matt tyler i think i should say matt tyler like a bunch of times um but we're uh we've got a lot to talk about this show is super jam-packed a really heavy news block looking at some of the follow-up stories that we've been covering during this whole situation unfolding some fcc news following up on some net neutrality and uh, we've got a gadget block to really dig into, to really cover, because uh, I'm sure, I am sure that those of you have some thoughts on uh, Sony's recent announcement for the PlayStation 5. That's going to be the second half of this podcast. Gary the Fireman, hey all, I'm in a Zoom class, so I'm just monitoring. <laughs> I feel like a lot of us have been multitasking that. Like, yeah, sure, I'll take this conference call. And also have another browser tab open with something I'm really paying attention to. Womp, womp. Oh, um, it's uh, it's just been a crazy little slice of life. I everything that's been going on in the world today. My wife and I. This is this is kind of notable. Um, since the end of February, I till till now. Sunday marked the first time that we went and visited a family member. And I got to say, this 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 whole situation has sort of instilled just that little sense of I mean, like I'm, I'm misusing this this term, this psych, uh, psychology term, but like a, a, a kind of a, a social agoraphobia. I can't tell you how stressful and unnerving it was to go to someone's house and maintain a little sense of uh, social distance and, you know, talk to some family members. Some of them have recently been to protests and just, uh, you know, how to teach our daughter, you know, like, okay, well, you can go and we can hang out and we're going to have some fun. But how about we do air hugs or fist bumps instead of running in for actual hugs? It's some a, a totally alien um, version of hanging out with family. So it, it's, it's been, it's been interesting, but for my wife and I, both of us are immunocompromised. Um, it was like this necessary first step towards figuring out what the new normal is going to be. And also it was just sort of, I think it was a little too long in the coming, in the making, I uh, it, <laughs> Boeing bite feet taps. That's awesome. Oh, my God. I, we need to make that the new social handshake. So you walk up to someone and, and you lean as far back as you can. And then you just kind of nudge toes. <laughs> we could make if we could make footsies the new handshake. Ah, I'm all for that. That's awesome. Uh, from Three Legged Couch. Man, telling kids no hugs is just heartbreaking. My nephew always wants to hug us every time he sees us. Um and and again, you know, my daughter is a gregarious, outgoing, social, and and, and socially savvy uh, young girl, and it, it's it's tough. But I'm I'm glad, uh, you know, like for as anxious, I mean, like as stressful as as this as this uh, this family gathering was. It was really informative. First of all, I just haven't seen this family in in so long, and they live near us, and it's just you know sort of heartbreaking that like we haven't been able to to, to sort of comfort each other during all of this craziness. Um, but but this was like the safe place for us to try, you know. Like my cousin isn't going to be upset if I'm kind of teaching my daughter you know, it, you know, very aggressively. Okay. Now go wash your hands. Now put your mask back on. Now do this. Now do that. You know, like maybe one of our friends would have taken that to mean like, you know, we think your house is filthy. <laughs> Whereas like my family, it's like, 
okay. They at least understand. Like, you have to love us. We're family. <laughs> All of our neuroticies, uh, you just have to cope with. You just have to deal with. Um, from uh, from Heike, all the isolation and closing of the society has definitely helped because the situation is over in Finland. Okay, that's great. Uh, from Route Night 5, I would love to make this a social tradition in the United States. I think there's something so beautifully simple about bowing. Uh, Route Night 5 saying we should turn to bowing like the Japanese. Um, Boeing bite, bowing and namaste. I, you know, I think it, it's so interesting, like down to the individual greetings that we have. We're gonna. It, it's not that we get back to normal. It's that we're gonna find a new normal. And I hope that, that there's some, that there's some consideration, that there's some like uh, you know sort of empathy in in what we come up with for the new normal. So, <laughs> Matt Tyler, family is important, man. So the reverse the reverse bow is the future. Namaste. All right. Let's jump in. Uh, like I said, this is going to be a jam-packed show, and I'm going to try and fly through the news. For most of what we've been covering in sort of tech news and tech politics has been a lot of follow-up stories, and that's that's really heavy this week. Uh, th there's, a, there's an ongoing story centering around the FCC that I really don't feel is getting enough attention, and it's something that I, I've been covering a little bit more granularly, I would say, for the last three years. And I feel like this is another important step towards an erosion of, uh, of what we expect the FCC to help us protect and to, to help regulate. But I want to start off. Of course, we're going to start off. JMX Warrior, housekeeping, eight minutes. So what I've got, I've got 9.08 in the a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Let's kick over into some housekeeping. Last week was pretty busy and was also really podcast heavy. So if you ever wanted to hear me ramble on for six hours... Between last week's Monday morning tech chat show to today, you can get about that much time of me talking. I, I, I'm currently putting out more content than I think any one person could ever possibly watch and still have time for other activities. So, housekeeping. A number one. I was really excited to put out this video. It is not doing any traffic on YouTube, so I'm seriously considering whether or not I'm going to keep doing these videos Sony Xperia 1 Mark II by the benchmarks is pro more powerful. Uh, really digging into some real world usage, video editing and rendering, transcoding, uh, file compression, anything that would sort of warrant, you know, like anything that justifies the cost of a $1,200 phone, I expect that phone to start taking over some of the responsibilities of tablets and laptops. So, uh, by the benchmarks is my series. Uh, I'm seeing, I'm trying to see if there's any audience for this, uh, but so far, not a lot of interest. So, um, I'm gonna keep going for a few more phones, and then uh, if I'm not seeing the numbers on these pick up, or if I'm not seeing them shared more, I, I think maybe that'll be the message I need: that people don't seem to care about how phones perform in real world conditions. But if you were curious at all about how uh, an Xperia 1 Mark II actually performs beyond just a Geekbench score. That's my video for it, so you can check it out. All right, uh, moving right along. I, I put out a mini review. I mean, it's an eight minute video, but it's really focusing on one specific idea for the OnePlus 8. And instead of going through my normal like granular, here's the design and here's how the camera does this and the battery and the wireless, everything on the OnePlus 8 is pretty great. Um, I really think it's a price performance ratio that is is very difficult to beat, especially in North America right now. And so uh, instead of doing my normal broad review, which I'm going to be saving more for the OnePlus 8 Pro, I'm breaking this down to the one make or break question that I think is is what people should be looking at if they're considering purchasing the OnePlus 8 Pro. And I think it all comes down to 5G. And it's not as simple as 5G good or 5G bad. Um, really, it's difficult to quantify what is the value of making this network transition. So that video is covering that for the OnePlus 8. Then I was so uh, so glad to have Enabong Edda return. Uh, this was on uh, last Friday's Creator Chat podcast. Uh, Bored at work. My buddy, my bro, my sis, my brother from another mother. Uh, that came out terribly, and and I 
I, I apologize for how awful that came out of my face just then. But I, again, uh, sharing some very thoughtful and a little emotional commentary on what's been going on in the world with protests and with the, the situation uh, surrounding disease. And uh, also, I got to say, for those of us who are walking, rocking quarantine haircuts, Enabong is looking real fly right now. I mean, it's a good look for him. He's keeping that beard in check. And, and I got to say, man, like seeing Enabong with hair. Dude, dude looks good. I'm, I'm very impressed. So, um, oh, Ruth Sunshine by the benchmarks is fun. Well, I'm glad you enjoy by the benchmarks. Hopefully, uh, if ten other people might be able to find that series, then uh, maybe I'll keep doing them. So, uh, rounding out my videos this week, the other one that I, I've really been wanting to, to, to keep on with. I, I spend a lot of time with super expensive premium devices, and I feel like. I'm not really doing my job as a reviewer unless I'm also trying to tackle more entry-level fare. And uh, here, on a good sale, a phone like the LG Stylo 6 can be had for around 150 bucks. So um, I feel like this is a pretty good look at what you can expect from a device that does not cost a lot of money. I mean, full MSRP, I think, is between... 200 and 250 depending on the carrier what what they're going to charge for the phone but this phone is super easy to find on sales well under msrp and uh when you're talking about 150 dollars from boost mobile uh the conversation gets a lot trickier for using an older phone or a used phone instead of a purpose-built entry-level device and this one really surprised me this is not a fast or powerful phone but it does a lot of things really, really well, including some of the best battery life on any device, um, uh, any any device this uh, this year. Uh, Matt Tyler, I sang the praise of the Stylo Six on the stream yesterday when we were talking low cost phones. I mean, it 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 kind of it, it's a little taste, it's a little glimpse, and like I want to play with a few other devices now. I still haven't gotten my hands on a Motorola, and I really need to do that. Um, let me get this out of the way here. And then lastly, like I was saying, there was a lot of podcasting going on last week. And uh, one of the shows I was most honored to join, uh, Steve Litchfield, the Phones Show Chat, episode 566, Just Some Gadget Guy, uh, got into a great conversation on uh, phones and cameras. Because uh, if you follow the Phones Show chat, I'm, I'm a big fan. I've been listening for a while. Um, Ted, uh, Ted, uh, the co-host, Steve's co-host, not a big fan of smartphone cameras. Like uh, regularly takes to the, well, you should just carry a standalone camera because smartphones not nearly as good. And so we got deep into the weeds. <laughs> I mean, for an hour long show, uh, I, I, I uh, apologize to the Phones Show chat audience because uh, I'm nothing if not long-winded, and uh, for only having about an hour, it, it was it was it, it was a lot of me rambling to condense my normal talking points into only an hour of show. So um, yeah, uh, it, 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 they were very gracious to let me just sort of prattle on for as long as I did. But again, they're, Steve is just real good people and, and someone I've been following in this tech space for many, many years um, and, and sort of sharing a lot of similar sentiments, you know, like our, our, what we value in phone cameras and also just some of that conversation surrounding competition. You know, it used to be nice when we had more than iOS and Android in the ecosystem to really shake up what was going on. So it's good times. Um, that was my week in a nutshell. And I think we just wrapped up housekeeping in seven minutes. Boom. I love it. Okay. Uh, like I said, we've got a lot to dig into. Um, oh, we've got a couple comments here too that I want to, I want to see. Um, from Alice Bockley. I'm not interested in these kinds of videos because even though I'm editing videos in 3D animations, often I'll never do it in a phone. Even if I could do it smoothly, the screen work area is frigging tiny. So uh, uh, Al Spockley says we can dump by the benchmarks. Sentinel909 says he enjoyed by the benchmarks. Um, uh, Root Knight 5, if LG made a Stylo Pro with a quad DAC and a 765G, I'd easily pay $500 for it. Root Knight, we're going to be talking about 
some Samsung and LG phones, second half of this uh, podcast as we get into the gadget block. So uh, make sure you, you hang around for that. Um, oh, from my LG Stylo video, the Sentinel 909. I know so many of those guys that tap away. Why is it not working? I don't get it. <laughs> and from Hakey, Steve's website, All About Symbian, was my favorite back in the day. Oh, happy days. All right. Let's get into some news. Let's get into some tech and politics. I, I know people don't like to hear that word politics when it comes to talking about tech, but uh, we've got some some pretty major stories to be digging into. And uh, I want to start off with a follow-up. This one I can blast through really quickly. But the ramifications of this are actually kind of important. Um, last week, we, we the last two weeks, we've been talking about uh, President Trump and the executive order where they're trying, where our, our current administration is trying to change the rules on how distribution platforms are regulated. And, and the frustrating thing is I actually do believe that we need some kind of reform for these types of regulations that protect uh, companies like Facebook. I just don't believe that our current elected officials will grasp all of the nuance of this when they're crafting new laws and new regulations, especially with our current leadership um, in the executive branch and our current positions of power in the Senate. It's, uh, it's really, it's, it's very complicated material. And, and we need some, some good legal scholars to start scalpeling through this. But at the same time, tech advances so much faster than our legal system can really keep up with. So, Twitter's making another move on how they're trying to rein in the spread of misinformation on their platform. And this sounds, just on the surface, this sounds like a good idea. Hold on for just a second. This is coming by way of CNBC, written up by Ryan Brown. Twitter puts fact-checking label on tweets linking 5G with the situation. Uh, Twitter is adding fact-checking labels to tweets that wrongly link new super-fast 5G mobile networks with the situation excuse me instead of deleting or hiding such tweets twitter is showing a message on them that reads quote get the facts on the situation when clicked on users are taken to a page titled no 5g isn't causing the situation which debunks the conspiracy theory by linking to credible media websites and other official sources uh, in a statement sent to cnbc we're pri uh, let me get, there's the quote. We're prioritizing the removal of situation content when it has a call to action that could potentially cause harm. As we've said previously, we will not take enforcement action on every tweet that contains incomplete or disputed information. So uh, let me get this. Uh, uh, there we go. So on the surface, we've been talking about this for a while. How do we head off these misinformation campaigns. Um, it's it's kind of cute and it's a little bit charming when you find a collective that is all about flat earth. And they're largely harmless individuals. Uh, they, they do disservice to a scientific discussion by trying to use sciency language to, I, I'm not sure what the end goal is for someone who's really into flat earth. Uh, but regardless, they, they only seem to mostly harm themselves with a little um, a, a, a little disservice to other scientific discussions. When we get into things like 5G, we're, we're seeing an active campaign that starts to encourage behavior um, that can be very destructive. Uh, we covered those stories a, um, a couple months back now with 5G towers getting burned, cases of arson. Um, disruption of the telecommunications network in certain regions and certain neighborhoods. And to me, I would feel like if I were an out-of-state bad actor and I were looking at how can I destabilize a community of people that I, uh, I'm sort of politically aligned against, this would be behavior that I would want to encourage. So on the surface of this, I'm very interested in following up how aggressive Twitter is going to get with these types of labels. The reason why is as soon as an outlet like Twitter or Facebook starts editorializing 
I actually think there's a strong legal argument to suggest that they are no longer protected by Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. So I am not a legal scholar, and my experiences with this are very focused on like YouTube-style distribution and uh, documentary filmmaking. That's where I've read up the most on my own uh, legal obligations for the distribution of content and how to utilize other companies' intellectual property. And I am nowhere near considering myself an expert on these types of topics, but my my feelings, my stance on them are very, uh, very conservative. Not conservative, conservative ideologically, like Democrat versus Republican, just like my expectations for fair use, commentary and critique, very limited. What you should and shouldn't be able to utilize for IP. Short story long. I would recommend that you all check out the YouTube channel um, Legal Eagle. Uh, DJ <laughs> is a trial attorney, and his his videos are genuinely entertaining. Uh, he he does these series of videos breaking down like courtroom scenes that are awesome and hilarious. Um, I I loved he did one on the TV show Suits where he basically like every clip he like well that would get you disbarred <laughs> you know like the entire show it's just this mess of the absolute worst depictions. I love the show, but it's. It's horrible, horrible legal commentary, completely inaccurate and terrible, terrible people. Like you would not want these people as your lawyers. But be, uh, alongside the media uh, commentary, he's also done a number of videos actually breaking down real topics that are facing um, international law and recently talked about how telecommunication services like Twitter and Facebook play ball under this one regulatory protection, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And part of the issue with what Twitter is doing is by writing and contributing to one of these tweets, they might actually be in violation of Section 230, which would remove some of those protections. And now we need to see, will this actually be challenged in a court? Because once it's challenged in a court, that will set precedence for how does a Facebook, an entity like Facebook, get to claim that they have no regulatory or distribution oversight? Like, we do not influence the, the content that people share on our platform, but we do remove it if it violates our terms of service or if it upsets our advertisers. And then we also manipulate the order and frequency of stories that you get to see. And I feel like that's a major sticking point for this type of regulation. Oh, we, we don't, we're, we're, we're not a publisher. We don't editorialize, but we totally change the layout of your Facebook feed to only serve you content that we think is going to keep you on our platform. And we remove content that upsets our advertisers. Twitter has taken this a step further. Twitter is now editorializing on the veracity or the truthiness of 5G conspiracy tweets. And I feel like this actually needs some kind of legal challenge now. And we need to examine what are the ramifications of this? How far can Twitter take a policy like that? And what are our expectations for free speech on private platforms? These are huge legal questions for us to be facing in the telecommunication space. It's it's really heady stuff. So the, again, this is another follow-up to a follow-up to a follow-up of stories that we've been watching in the space. And we're going to have to keep following up on this. This is, this is potentially the next phase of whatever the internet will, will resemble. And it's crazy. Not a coon 61. You put me on to legal legal a few weeks ago, and now I can't stop watching. I love that channel uh, so much. I didn't know it, I, and I mean, like, again, for as much as I geek out on, on like, what is the law? <laughs> say about stuff like this like I, I mean in a past life i must have been a, a lawyer even though i don't believe in past lives check out the channel if you like really savvy and informed commentary on topics um and especially on media you know like I, i'm not a fan of reacts videos but i love watching a corridor crew break down visual effects because i know they know what they're talking about same thing for legal legal I could rewatch his video on My Cousin Vinny. I could just put it on a loop all day. I, I love that movie. I love his channel. His, his commentary is so savvy, smart, and he's funny. 
and that and I love that. It, it's it's just genuinely good work, and I cannot say enough nice things about about his channel. All right, we've got a few more people joining the live chat. Uh, Two Spirits four one one saying good morning. Got Pacoston J Million NYC. What's up? How you doing, sir? Um, and then uh, Vasicos eight. I remember when Facebook feed was chronological order. Simpler times. And again, we lose some of that. I, I don't interact with on Instagram at all anymore. I used to live out of Instagram for photo sharing. And it just sucked. All the fun out of Instagram when there was zero option for me to keep the feed chronological. If my friend shares something that they're doing right then, I want to know right then. I don't want to know in three days and then I look like like a doofus saying, oh, hey, that looked like it was fun. I'm so glad you guys had a good time three days ago. Drives me crazy. Every single time a platform goes to some sort of managed feed as opposed to chronological order, it kills. It kills any interest I have in using that platform. Vazikos 8, I loved Legal Eagle on Daredevil. Ah, so good. And Heiki, what was the channel's name again? Legal Eagle. Check it out on YouTube. Tell him Juan sent you. <laughs> you won't know what that means. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is just a quick teaser of a story. You know how I say we like to follow up on stories? Uh, this is coming out of Axios. It's not even a real thing yet, but I'm putting this on your radar because this is a story we're going to have to follow up on in a couple months. And uh, this was written up by Margaret Harding McGill over on Axios. Uh, House Probe wants big tech CEOs to testify in July. Uh, the public grilling of the heads of the biggest tech companies would come as scrutiny over the power of their platforms heats up. Uh, basically, there's a judiciary committee that is looking into antitrust issues with uh, Apple, Google, Facebook, and Amazon, um, you know, major players in data-driven and uh, online services and big information. There's no in info on this yet. There, there, there isn't a story here yet, but we're seeing some momentum towards this type of regulatory oversight, FTC getting involved in how these companies do business. And what are the, the legal regulations and responsibilities for how a big data company like Facebook, what are the rules that they should have to play by in the 21st century? Just putting this on your radar, Axios. Again, all of the stories and all of the housekeeping and all of the links that we're talking about, they're going to be available on the show notes on somegadgetguy.com so you can follow up on this. I would keep my eye on this. Again, what is the next phase of the internet? It's going to be defined by these types of political and legal exercises. And I think while we would all agree something needs to change in how these companies do business with consumers, I think we'd all be a little concerned about our current leadership. Uh, we don't have enough people who are tech savvy at the top seats of power in our country to be making these kinds of convert, uh, making these kinds of decisions without a lot of push from consumers. Um, liberal or conservative, I feel like there are so many things we should be agreeing on our problems and maybe then just disagreeing about what the solution should be I'm not confident in our leadership to pick up on that nuance. I feel many of you would likely agree with me. <laughs> so we need to keep an eye on this stuff. Uh, a similar story uh, that, that's that been, uh, I, I want to say this broke, when did this break? Two or three days ago? Um, oh, no, this was last week. I had this on the docket for last week and I couldn't fit it in. Dave Bow Nine taking bets on if a senator asks how to take a screenshot. <laughs> well, you see, the internet's a series of tubes, and you don't want your internet getting clogged up by someone else's internet. And when you send an internet, it gets interneted. Um, sorry, uh, this is coming out of NBC News. Another story worth keeping an eye on. You guys remember how cranky I got when uh, the story on Xiaomi broke. You know, I, I get a lot of comments on my video saying how every other phone is overpriced because a company like Xiaomi can put a top of the line chipset in a mediocre phone and charge half the price. And that's what everyone should do. 
because people only seem to fixate on like one spec to make their fanboy uh, decision on a smartphone. I got real upset when we found out Xiaomi was tracking your browser data even when you enabled incognito mode. And that outcry actually changed their policy where you can go into your browsing and change a setter, a setting in your browser to disable tracking when you use incognito mode. They don't do it for you, but they at least offered you the ability to disable their tracking your behavior in incognito mode. Well, <laughs> Matt Tyler, Juan Cranky? No, I don't believe you. Um, well, apparently it would seem that if you've been browsing in incognito or in private mode, that Google has been keeping tabs on your browsing and incognito behavior. Uh, Google is facing a $5 billion lawsuit in the United States for tracking private internet use. Uh, again, this is coming by way of NBC News. Who's got the byline on this? Oh, they pulled it from Reuters. I should have just gone to Reuters. Dang it, NBC. You don't do your own investigative journalism anymore, do you? All right. Uh, from the article, Google was sued on Tuesday. This was a week ago in a proposed class action lawsuit accusing the Internet search company of illegally invading the privacy of millions by of users by pervasively tracking their Internet use through browsers set in private mode. The lawsuit seeks at least five billion, accusing the Alphabet Incorporated unit of surreptitiously collecting information about what people view online and where they browse, despite but they're using what Google calls incognito mode. Uh, this is from the actual complaint. Google, quote, cannot continue to engage in the covert and unauthorized data collection from virtually every American with a computer or a phone. Um, as we clearly state, each time you open a new incognito tab, websites might be able to collect information about your browsing activity, said Jose Castaneda. Castaneda, a Google spokesman um, says the Mountain View, California-based company will defend itself vigorously against the claims. Um, there is there is a significant uh, there is a significant issue at play here, where we need to examine how consumers are conditioned. You open up your browser and you have an expectation of privacy when you use a privacy mode. I feel like there is a huge re-education that needs to happen where we say, oh, no, no, just because it's you're, you're in incognito mode and it won't show up in your list of websites, anything you do is probably being tracked in some form or fashion now. I feel like... It's not enough to bury that kind of language in legalese, paragraphs deep into a terms of service that you agree to, but you don't really, no one really reads the terms of service. Instead, I feel like we need to make these companies put this information up forward. Every time you click on incognito mode on, in Chrome for the next year, there should be a little square saying, this is, this is going to be removed from your search history, but know that companies and entities online are still tracking your, uh, your browsing behavior through potentially user identifiable means. You are not safe just by going into incognito mode because right now I feel a lot of people are, are probably, uh, probably believe that their, their activities are somehow masked or safe from this type of behavior. Um, let's see, uh, from Aditi Anil, wait, so Google knows, hmm, that explains the ads I've been getting. <laughs> Again, we like, uh, I still feel like we're probably still being voice tracked. Um, Tech Love and Mama saying hey, and uh, saying hey to me and everyone in the chat. Everyone say hey to Tech Love and Mama, uh, another YouTube channel you should be giving a share, giving a follow. Um, Matt Tyler, Google being dishonest? I don't believe you. Something tells me Matt's catchphrase this week in the live chat is going to be, I don't believe you. <laughs> Dave Bo9, they'll settle for $5 million, no guilt admitted. 
<laughs> like, oh yeah, they totally learned their lesson with that yeah, $2 million fee that they're going to pay the lawyers involved in this case. And they'll totally change their behavior. I, I, again, I'm putting this on people's radars because I want to see what the end game is for something like this. Let's say they manage to win a $5 billion award out of a court. Then it's going to be appealed. We're going to see this legal action in courts for a decade if it goes anywhere. And at the end of that, like Dave Bo9 is kind of joking about, I really think we're going to get to some punitive action or corrective action that's going to barely be a blip on Alphabet's quarterly financials. Like it will have been absorbed as a tax for doing business the way that they're currently doing and that nothing will change and that they, they don't have to um, assume any guilt or responsibility for violating people's privacy. Uh. <laughs> from Fabies. Incognito mode is just for you. It's not for us. We're Google. Uh, Sean Diggs Tech, how about Firefox Focus? It claims private. So here's the deal. Um, let's say you do any type of browsing in a, in a private way. Incognito mode, one of these specialty browsers. As soon as you interact with cookies on different websites or with other people who aren't engaged in any kind of privacy behavior, your usage is still probably being tracked in some way. And with enough information coming from these incognito sources, a company like Facebook can build a file on you and can build behavior on you and can inform all of the websites that do that do Facebook ads and Facebook data tracking on your behavior with you actively trying to remove yourself from Facebook's files. Um, it, it's, it's insanely difficult to properly separate yourself from the internet in a way that you can still participate online and have some expectation of privacy. Uh, from Wes Easton on Facebook, watching uh, the stream on Facebook, but Juan, why is the illusion of privacy still perpetuated despite the fact that we all keep seeing that there's no way for our actions to truly remain private? We're all logged and tracked regardless, right? And Wes Easton totally nails it. Um, we, can, we can pay lip service to the idea of privacy. We can kind of play these cat and mouse games. But at the end of the day, I, I really don't believe there's any way to properly firewall yourself off from the internet and still be able to interact on the internet. My, my argument in this conversation is to properly disclose what information is being sourced, to have some kind of oversight so that consumers can more, um, can more actively participate. Those who choose to and those who don't will have the options to examine how is their personal information being utilized by a company. And then I just want disclosure. You know, I, I love that Apple is talking about privacy and security, but I'd also like to be able to change Siri's search search engine. Like, let's say I have zero interest in doing business with Google. I can't tell Siri to use DuckDuckGo. I can't tell Siri to use um, uh, Bing if I want to use Bing. I can't tell Siri to, I mean, Apple doesn't have a proprietary search solution. They receive billions of dollars a year from Google to make sure you can't use Siri with anything but Google. So Apple isn't selling off your, your user data, but they are profiting from making sure that you don't have a choice in what search you would like to use on your iPhone. And legally, I think they can make the claim, we don't sell your user data, but it's sort of an intellectual dishonesty that they aren't profiting from another company having access to your search, uh, your search behavior. So that that's that's what I really hope comes from all of this. We need to let people know you're not private. Incognito mode? <laughs> nope, you're not private. But for those of you who have concerns, maybe these are resources you might want to take a look at. For those of you who don't have anything to hide. You can see what you don't have to hide, and you have a clearer uh, example of how these companies profit off of your data. 
And then I just think we need a kind of a restructuring of how a lot of these social services work. And that's going to come through savvy regulators actually engaging with these companies. And again, I don't think any of us have a lot of faith in that. <laughs> West Easton, he said my name. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, let me get this out of the way here. Alice Bockley asking if Apple is objectively any better. I, I don't think anyone is. I, I, I don't think you can say, you can clearly state that one company is objectively better in this space. It's really, I feel, a collection of different pros and cons. I mean, it always is, isn't it? I mean, I think that's the only fair way to break this down because as plebes using these products, we don't get any insight into the huge and complicated deals that go on behind the scenes. I don't know what the full particulars of Google and Apple's relationship is. I'm on the outside looking at one setting on, on my iPhone that I really want to change that I can't change. So it's really just my speculation at this point. Why can't I change it? Well, Google and Apple must be working together. When I, when I search for that, when I bing <laughs> Google and Apple working together on search, I get results saying that Apple profits. So... I follow that money and I'm eventually led into a roadblock where I can't dig any further. But the current situation that I see is if you use Surrey, data gets sent to Google. And if enough information is sent to Google, even if you never sign in with a Gmail account, Google builds a user profile on that search. So now one of the features of an iPhone is to use Siri. But if I if I really properly don't want Google to have any of my information there, then I need to jump through a bunch of hoops to make sure I'm not using Google as my search provider. That's the, that's the truth. That's the, the reality of how complicated this stuff gets and that will never be privy to the full ramifications of how that deal goes down until we really get involved. <laughs> uh, all right, moving right along. <sighs> we haven't really dug deep on an FCC broadband rollout net neutrality story for a while. So all of these kind of got lumped in together at the same time. And I'm going to ask for a little bit of patience here because I've got to thread through one to talk about the other one to follow up on another one. And then this takes us back to a story I covered over two years ago or a little less than two years ago. And it's kind of a bad look. I'm not a huge fan of how we're managing broadband distribution and uh, net neutrality in our country today. And I feel like we're starting to see evidence of how the removal of net neutrality as a policy is starting to impact consumers. So, jumping in first with a story from Ars Technica. Uh, uh, Cox slows internet speeds in entire neighborhoods to punish any heavy users. Uh, uh, this is written up by John Brodkin. I love his work on net neutrality over on Ars Technica. Give him a follow, if not Ars Technica um, completely. But he breaks down, and, and I really want you to read through this story. I'm only going to do a basic, a super surface level uh, summation. Um, Cox has a gigabit tier plan where you get a 1,000 meg download and a 35 meg upload speed. There are a handful of heavy users, and um, Ars Technica follows up with one individual who just wants to be known as Mike, who is responsible for... 8 to 12 terabytes of uploading per month. Well, this seems to rub Cox the wrong way and is impacting, uh, is a, so, sort of a, a shot at what they call their acceptable use policy and um, Cox's terms of service. So if you were the CEO or the board on an internet service provider, and you looked at a neighborhood, you looked at a community, and you saw, like, man, the, the data usage is through the roof in this community. Let's really dig in. Let's find out why. And you saw that one guy was uploading eight terabytes of information every month. What would you do? 
you would, of course, slow down the whole neighborhood, right? One guy is responsible for this huge chunk of usage. Better slow down the whole community. I mean, it's because of the situation and work from home and all these other reasons. Everyone, everyone takes a data upload penalty. And even though you're paying for 1,000 down and 35 up, we're going to slow down your upload speed to 10 meg to make sure that everyone has a consistent experience on our network. <laughs> so that's bad. <laughs> but we've been talking about this for a while. I mean, here in the United States, we were promised fiber to home. For, for decades, we have been giving ISP sweetheart deals. We've been giving them tax breaks. We've been giving them tax credits. We've been giving them tax dollars, uh, prefer preferential zoning. We've allowed them to write legis legislation at the city and state level to prevent competition. And we've never gotten fiber to home. We were promised this. We've been paying for it. We've overpaid for it. The amount of money that the, the American taxpayers have contributed to the coffers of ISPs, we should have had fiber to home two times over. Hasn't happened. We've been playing with these tricks on cable on how to boost certain aspects of download speeds, but I still can't get more than a 20 meg upload. I don't know that we've been shown a clear indication of how important data connectivity is in the 21st century than the situation and working from home and being able to jump into a video conference. I'm taking meetings with uh, appointments with my doctors. I would I I I have some pretty gnarly skin conditions. I have psoriasis. I would like to be able to send better than standard definition plus video to my dermatologist so that that so that she can see some of the issues I face with my skin. Right now, we're in some weird private video chat where if she gets like a 720p video stream, it's horrifically pixelated. She showed me a screenshot. I, I mean, apparently I have a terrible skin condition that causes large square blocks to pop up on my skin. What fixes that is better upload speeds and better download speeds. The entire future of our economy, education, healthcare, everything depends on us being competitive in the 21st century. So the United States is not competitive in the 21st century. We have fallen out of the top 10 global average speeds. Uh, this is coming from decisiondata.org. We are now number 11 here in the United States. Uh, I want to get down to these actual charts. Here, here are the top 10. Singapore, Hong Kong, Romania, Romania, South Korea, Switzerland, Tha uh, Taiwan, Monaco, Andorra, Hungary, and Sweden. United States is number 11, and our average speeds are 124 megabit per second. And I'm assuming they, they mostly mean download speeds because we have terrible infrastructure for any kind of upload speeds here in the United States. So one of the reasons why, uh, one of the reasons given, Ajit Pai, the head of the FCC, talking about repealing net neutrality was to improve broadband, distrib broadband distribution. And those poor, poor ISPs couldn't improve speed unless we got rid of net neutrality. And we reclassified the internet as a telecommunication service like telephone lines, and we turned it into an information service like Facebook. According to the FCC, the commission responsible for regulating the internet, the internet is the same as Facebook or Google. A service on the internet is the same as the internet. And we all know that this is fake and we all know that that's false, but they are classifying the internet in a way where it cannot be regulated like telephone lines while promising that this deregulation will improve speeds. The United States has fallen. We are no longer in the top 10. We've fallen from number 10, which wasn't great anyway, to number 11. I don't know that we can have better evidence that this casual linking of net neutrality to broadband distribution was always a lie. And I mean that in a potentially legally 
active way. There is a an argument to be made that certain industries will profit from the, the dissemination of that kind of information from the head of a regulatory agency. It was with purpose disseminated and a falsehood that will now take legal scholars years to untangle the ramifications of that. <laughs> and boing by and misrepresented coverage maps. We can't even get good data out of the FCC as to who has access to broadband data. That's another point. I haven't added a story about that, but that was another recent story that broke um, talking about how this is all uh, terribly, terribly manipulated. Because on top of this, what we also have to take a look at is net neutrality policy. So net neutrality has not improved, sorry, repealing net neutrality has not improved broadband speeds or broadband distribution as it relates to competition globally. And we have no good information on how many households in the United States do not have access to some form of broadband. Our current estimates are between 20 and 30 million Americans have zero access. We don't know. And on top of that, we don't know how many people can't afford, they might have access to it, but they can't afford some form of broadband internet or broadband access. So that's not necessarily a net neutrality issue. But what is a net neutrality issue is how ISPs and carriers can manipulate content for their own in-house services. So this is a tweet by Jeffrey Starks. He is a commissioner on the FCC. Uh, this gives me great concern. ISPs that give their own content preferential treatment undermine competition and strengthen the case for net neutrality. HBO Max won't hit AT&T data caps, but Netflix and Disney Plus will. I don't know what it is about AT&T. I used to have a pretty chummy relationship with AT&T back in the day. Like uh, they, they used to have a, a reviewer outreach program um, that was really solid. We would get hands on with phones. We would have early launches. Like I used to go to AT&T stores for every new iPhone launch because they'd open up the store uh, early and I could, you know, kind of get in there and play. And I'd, you know, I'd be able to uh, do news hits. You know, I, I've been on every single uh, L.A.-based news show talking about iPhones. Um, you know, four in the morning. Here's the iPhone success. And it has a headphone jack and a great camera. Um, but AT&T has always tried to play this game of keeping some kind of cap or throttle in place and then working deals with content distributors to receive additional funds to prevent their content from getting slowed. I want to say it was around the time of the LG Flex. When was that? 2016? 2017? Somewhere in there. That uh, AT&T had proposed this plan. At one of their developer conferences, um, they, they used to have these. It was right before CES. And you would go and AT&T would talk about all the great work that they were doing with like AI and content distribution. And one of the things they talked about was a plan to offset the costs of data. So back then you had like a two gigabyte cap, and, you know, you paid per gig and you, you know, that data would evaporate. So I paid for two gigs and I only used one, but I don't get the other gig that I paid for. They introduced a plan where they could go to a video streaming platform and say, Sure would be a shame if we had to throttle the crap out of your video streaming service and anyone on AT&T's network isn't going to want to use your service because it counts against their data. You should pay us and we'll eliminate that data usage from our subscribers network. If you can keep paying, then someone who's on a two gigabyte plan they can stream all the video they want and it won't count against their data. How magnanimous are we or AT&T? So apparently they're doing the same thing again. There are caps, there are throttle points in place, there's limits to how you use a plan on AT&T. And you know, if you just wanna stream HBO Max stuff, well, I mean, that's not gonna count against your data cap. How great is that? You don't wanna use Netflix and Disney Plus because that's gonna you're gonna run out of data. That's how, how our network works. 
man, Netflix data, whew, that's a finite quantity. But HBO Max data, I mean, we have infinite bandwidth for that. That That's not going to impact our ability to do this kind of stuff. And that is an example of how not having net neutrality in place messes up the landscape for consumers. It was so frustrating when net neutrality was repealed the day after we had a whole bunch of of sort of faux conservative, not real conservative, but faux conservative talking heads. Oh, see, I can still post memes. The internet didn't break overnight. It was never going to be a sudden flip the switch and everything's terrible. It was always going to be a lobster pot effect, a little shaving here, implementing a throttle point there, charging a little bit more for unlimited data and then not letting that be unlimited data. You know, that Cox story, the person who's streaming or uploading eight terabytes of information every month pays something like 200 bucks a month to get the faster upload speed and also not have a throttle cap on his data. And it's not unlimited because he's uploading so much that Cox is saying, well, nope, now you're uploading too much. Verizon does the same thing. They have like four different plans that are called unlimited and none of them are unlimited. All of them have choke points at some point that is the future of how net neutrality is going to erode and erode and erode and you lose a little something here or you get forced into a service there or there's a pain point that oh man this is gonna this is gonna mess up my bill i better not use this i better use that instead that is the future without net neutrality and it, it, if you care about free market free competition our gatekeepers shouldn't be ISPs. Our gatekeepers shouldn't be companies that have a vested interest in promoting some content over other content. Competition should be competition. You know, it should. We want a fair and level playing field. And this is what's so frustrating. I know, like T-Mobile also had a spin on this too, and it was frustrating because the service was good. We partner with these people so that you can stream this and, it, you know, we're going to kind of reduce quality, but it still stood in the way of net neutrality. It still was preferential treatment for one service over another service. And I'm glad that T-Mobile eventually <clears throat> kind of dismantled some of that. It's just now that net neutrality has been abolished by this current FCC, it's it's going to be a a bigger problem for us to untangle this. It was a 10 year fight to get some kind of basic low level net neutrality policy in place. And it's probably gonna be another 10 year fight to get it reinstated. Uh, Simon says, Hypno, you can't be a manager and a promoter, but if you lobby uh, this presidential administration and you get them to install a telecom shell, then yeah, you totally can be. And it's good for business, why wouldn't you? So we get to all of this, and um, what is the FCC actually doing? They, they, they completely misrepresented broadband adoption. They have not given us good numbers on broadband improvements, and we've fallen out of the top 10 globally. There's obviously an FCC response. The FCC is going to do something. They're going to throw money at the problem. Uh, the FCC will hand out $16 billion over 10 years to ISPs to expand broadband, written up by Dave LeClaire over at Android Authority. Um, companies that take part in this program will need to provide voice and broadband services in unserved areas. The money is set to be paid monthly over 10 years, which is a bit of a contentious decision among members of the FCC panel. Jeffrey Starks, the person that we just quoted from this previous tweet about HBO Max, uh, Jeff Jeffrey Starks said he would have preferred to start with a smaller budget or shorter term of support so that the bulk could be spent after we complete the mapping overhaul. And there he's talking about trying to verify who does and does not have broadband access because we don't even have that data. But a JPI is ready to give ISPs $16 billion. And the kicker is there's almost no oversight. There, there, there is no, there is no goal. There is no measure of success. ISPs are just going to get $16 billion in taxpayer monies 
And there's no way for us to hold them accountable under this current broadband expansion plan. And this isn't the first time. We have given these companies billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars, and they still haven't expanded broadband to rural areas. They still haven't improved broadband speeds in denser populations and coverage. None of this has improved. I mean, if we look at the amount of money taxpayers have given these companies to the actual improvements that they've that they've made and then we look at the profits that they report it seems like almost all of this money just goes into the coffers of the profits and not a lot of it or at least not a uh, comparable amount is being spent on the actual network improvements that we're supposedly paying for <laughs> boing bite 16 billion into the furnace um <laughs> it, it's it's kind of horrific. And the reason why I want to highlight this here is because two years ago, on my birthday, August 16 of 2018, we talked about this story from Ars Technica, written up by John Brodkin. And look what's come to pass. ISPs say they can't expand broadband unless government gives them more money. The top two lobbying firms for the telecommunications industry, U.S. Telecom and the NTCA, said, like electricity, broadband is essential to every American. Yet U.S. broadband infrastructure has been financed largely by the private sector without assurance that such costs can be recovered through increased consumer rates. So first of all, that's not true. Uh, broadband infrastructure has largely been uh, created and, and managed and improved off of public funds. And the, the subscriber rates pay into what should be network improvements, not just profits. But basically, both of these uh, lobbying firms, the uh, was it U.S. Telecom is represents AT&T, Verizon and CenturyLink, while the NTCA represents nearly 850 small ISPs. Broadband should be funded like a utility, like a public utility, like telephone lines and water. But you can't tell us how to improve our networks and we should get all the profit. Two years ago, we talked about this story and I've been bringing this up numerous times. This is not a free market Democrat versus Republican uh, debate. Taxpayer funds are going directly to private companies, and there is no oversight or no uh, regulatory action for them to meet the goals of utilizing taxpayer funds. And the industry is still playing a kind of mafia style game. Sure would be a shame if your network doesn't improve. Uh, you should be giving us all those taxpayer funds and, uh, and we should get to keep all the profits. And you can't tell us what to do with our networks. So we get to control the network, profit off of the network, and you get to pay for those, for the, for those improvements out of the taxpayers. And we, we're not responsible for anything, but you can't tell us what to do. Two years ago, and now Ajit Pai is the head of the FCC, is going to be giving them another $16 billion in taxpayer funds. $16 billion. When we should have, this should be a, I agree with the lobbying firms for the telecommunications industry. The internet is, should be a public utility, but that means it should be regulated like water and telephone lines. It's the only thing that makes sense if we're going to dump that much public money into this infrastructure, we should have a say in how it's managed and, and how we generate income off of it. So just to further infuriate what what the situation really resembles. Uh, let me go back into that Ars Technica story about Cox. Let me see if I can find what Mike was paying. Um, hold on. Okay. So at the end of this article, they talk about how Mike's promotional deal with Cox is about to end. Uh, I'll be paying, 
once once his promo deal ends, I'll be paying one hundred and seventy five dollars a month for quote unlimited data. That's one uh, that's one thousand meg down and thirty five meg up. But it, it does have significant caps, and it's they're throttling an entire neighborhood because of a handful of heavy users. And this is apparently a policy that has extended to other neighborhoods too. If we had public infrastructure, what do you think data rates and prices would look like? If, if broadband were funded by a community and managed by an actual utility-based organization, like your power, your water, what do you think data would look like? Anyone? G g g give me, g throw out some numbers. Let let's say a public utility funded the rollout of fiber to home and you had one one meg uh, sorry a gigabit down and gigabit up what 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 would that look like i can tell you what that would look like because that's currently the reality in chattanooga tennessee so right now in chattanooga <clears throat> Let me cue, back, cue this back up. This is EPB. This is the electricity company in Chattanooga, Tennessee. 300 meg down, 300 meg up, $58 a month. Gigabit down, gigabit up, $68 a month. And then they've got a ridiculous option. Do you want 10 gig down and 10 gig up? That's going to be $300 a month. $68 a month would get you fiber to home gigabit internet paid just directly through the power company. And then the money stays in Chattanooga. The money stays in improving Chattanooga's infrastructure, telecommunications industry, jobs in Chattanooga. It doesn't go into the coffers of shareholders for Cox, it doesn't leave that community where then it doesn't pay for the infrastructure locally. If we're going to say, if the telecommunications industry says that internet is as important a utility as power and water, that's what I want. I'll tell you now, I get 300 down, 20 up. 300 meg down, 20 up. I am not paying... $68 a month. I'm paying significantly more than $68 a month. This is, this is one of the greatest bilkings of the American people that has been playing out since the days of copper telephone wires getting installed into homes. And we, we won't be able to fix it with our current elected clowns in this country. JMX Warrior, we have multiple community broadband service providers here in the UK. The government has encouraged and helped fund them over the years, mostly for rural areas. Competition is good. So Chattanooga is blowing it up. I mean, Chattanooga's gigabit is phenomenal. So of course, Tennessee made, made laws to prevent it from spreading to the rest of Tennessee. So in the rest of Tennessee, you can't get gigabit home internet and they're still talking about throwing more tax dollar money at the companies who don't give uh, Tennessee residents better competition. It's maddening. It, I mean, it's 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 ridiculous. This is crazy. Um, JT Moat, I pay $70 a month for gigabit down and up on Google Fiber. I really lucked out with my apartment. I want that so bad. And Boeing Byte, 10 gigabit Cat 6A switches are prohibitively expensive. <laughs> I mean, I like, I, uh, what is, what is, I, I, my NAS actually supports uh, 10 gig Ethernet. So one of my next purchases is going to be a 10 gig switch. <laughs> Um, Simon says, Hypno, how much did Chattanooga pay to have it installed? I don't remember what the numbers are. There is actually a, um, like if you had, uh, check out, starting with the Wikipedia, Chattanooga petitioned the Department of Energy for a grant. I believe it was a grant. Someone please correct me if I'm wrong there. 
And so they received some monies from the federal government and then started a program where they went out to Chattanooga residents to sign up for the offer. So money came in initially for that. Um, but the Department of Energy was really interested in getting fiber to homes out there because that's really one of the only ways that we'll be able to um, reform, uh, to refine the telecommunications and energy grid in the United States. Uh, right now, uh, the, the United States energy grid is aged and kind of falling apart, and it's a mismatch of different nodes and components to try and communicate across the country. Um, it would not be difficult for a bad actor in this new era of cyber warfare to knock out a couple key nodes in our energy grid and basically you know, keep the East Coast blacked out for a month. It would, we, we have humongously serious national security issues at, at stake here. And part of the solution would be rolling fiber to home, having a much smarter implementation for how energy is distributed on our energy grid. So the Department of Energy, DOE, I mean, this is the same agency that's responsible for managing our nuclear stockpiles. Um, was very interested in rolling out a pilot program. And they chose Chattanooga. They approved this grant. They got some uh, federal funds to help roll this out. And then I want to say it was something like under three years where the initial costs for rolling out fiber through EPB were paid for and profiting for the community. So Chattanooga makes money on $68 a month gigabit internet and that money stays in Chattanooga to improve Chattanooga services, Chattanooga telecommunication, Chattanooga schools. That's how a utility functions. <laughs> and that's what we should all want for all of our communities. So that was a bit of a block to chew up. It kind of hit all at the same time. We haven't had an FCC story like this for a bit. And then we had the you know US falls in broadband rankings, FCC dumping billions into these companies, and then all of these things kind of piecing together. So I appreciate you folks hanging with me through a good chunk of tech politics, but we should be paying very close attention to how our tax dollars are being spent and what we get for those tax dollars because I don't think we're getting our money's worth. But I know a select minority of individuals on the boards of these companies and the shareholders for these companies are going to be laughing all the way to the bank. And we get to pay for it. So double win there. Really, really rough. <laughs> So um, let's get this out of the way here. And let's jump into a quick chat on uh, the subreddit. Oh, I need to make sure am I on the right page. Uh, let me refresh the subreddit here real quick. Okay. So every podcast has a subreddit and my podcast is no exception. Now, some subreddits are all about, you know, like the news links that they want the, the hosts to talk about or just a fun community place for people to hang out and tell the hosts that they're super cool. My subreddit is focused on trying to help promote content creators that we feel deserve more attention. So if you go to reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles, you will find a community of people that are sharing and promoting content that they feel likely isn't getting the traffic uh, that YouTube should be sending to those channels. So they could be larger YouTube channels. They could be smaller channels trying to monetize. I, I think we would all agree that YouTube is not the, the garden fostering the growth of new channels like it used to be. So uh, let me go into a uh, screen share here. These are the top stories on reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. A number one, and I'm so stoked to see this leading the subreddit for the last week. Uh, one of my all-time favorite commentary channels is Tech Alter. Uh, it's a, a just a beautifully produced business examination of the tech industry. And... Uh, uh, he, he recently spun off a secondary channel called The Friday Checkout. And uh, this currently only has 11,000 subscribers. Now, why would you do that? Let me tell you why. If you host 
more than one kind of con uh, content on one YouTube channel, YouTube punishes your channel. The fact that I put up smartphone reviews, gadget reviews, audio reviews, and a podcast on one YouTube channel. Every single time I put up a podcast, well, that's a longer video and not as many people watched it. So now we're not gonna recommend your shorter videos. My channel gets hammered for having different topics on one YouTube channel. That's how narrowly vice grip focused YouTube is now for promoting popularity. If your channel is this and that, YouTube doesn't know what to do with you in the algorithm and you get punished for it. My views have been, have been, uh, well, actually my views are up. My monetization has never been lower. <laughs> and, and part of that is because I'm not playing this. I only talk about iPhones on this channel and I'll only talk about galaxies on that channel. Nonsense. So tech alter tried to play the game correctly. If you've been a fan of Tech Alter, he put he was putting out YouTube stories. I just wanted to do a quick little video talking about this one thing that I thought was interesting. You can watch it in his community feed, but YouTube's community stories game is broken. It does not work. And it just becomes kind of a, a crappy place for people to like host fake contests. So to prevent his real monetized, beautifully produced business channel from getting destroyed by YouTube's algorithm for having other videos, he's forced to create a second channel on YouTube. He can't split the content on one channel. He's got to double up the workload and now build up the audience to monetize a second channel. I hate playing that game, but his content is brilliant, and I really hope you'll support Tech Alter and the Friday, the Friday checkout. Um, uh, yeah, and he's leading the subreddit this week. Samsung is putting ads on lock screens. The Friday checkout by way of Tech Alter. Uh, number two. Oh, I didn't upvote this. There we go. Uh, number two, Mr. Mobile. Looking back at the crazy days of Nokia's craziest designs uh, when phones were fun. Uh, and again, the thumbnail is hilarious for all of the different form factors of Nokia devices that we've seen through the years. Number three, making a repeat appearance, the TCL 10 Pro review from LFA Reviews. LFA is my boy for headphone reviews. And if you want the same kind of uh, well, uh, well thought out commentary on a smartphone, the same kind of well thought out commentary he delivers for earbuds. Give this a share, help this dude out. Again, LFA mostly reviews headphones. So when he puts out a smartphone review, the YouTube algorithm doesn't know what to do with it. And if you'd like to support the production of engaged, well-researched and thoughtful commentary on tech products, viewers need to give the video a push because we know YouTube won't. Uh, moving right along, uh, we've got our, our, uh, from Ryan Thomas, uh, 43,000 subscribers, a look back at the HTC One M8. Uh, the, is this the number four, one, two, three, four, f the number five spot rounding out the top five across the podcast with Sam and Matt featuring Fat Produce himself, Mr. Andrew Wallace, a good buddy, of all three of them, good buddies of mine. And just wonderful to see a, uh, a homegrown tech live stream building up a totally community-driven show and a wonderful commentary. And we've got TK Bay looking at the Android 11 beta. We've got Tech Alter talking about his terrible experiences with YouTube stories. We've got Mr. Tech Rant, Trenton Marshall, looking at the OnePlus 8. Got Pitaka Cases by way of Zach Talks Tech. A OnePlus 7T review looking at the lover of tech, uh, a, a look back at a, a long-term review of the OnePlus 7T, a tech spurt with the Redmi Note 9, and then my by the benchmarks rounding out. Oh, actually, I think this is past the top 10 at this point, but uh, I'll cap it right here. My uh, Xperia 1 Mark II review, or not review, uh, benchmarks video. Uh, kind of finishing off our look back at this last week. Every week, we pick up a few more subscribers, a few more followers. I want to plan something special when the subreddit hits a 1,000. 
We're at 909 members on reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. Ah. So, this is the plea. This is the, uh, the call to action I put out every week. Never has it been more important to support your favorite content creators. Those of you who have the means and the privilege and the luxury of having a direct financial contribution through Super Chats or Patreons or PayPals or whatever service someone's using, that is humongously appreciated. Um, it helps keep the lights on when I pick up a Patreon subscriber for a month, and hopefully I'm delivering a, a ton of content that you folks find interesting. But outside of that financial uh, support, if you don't have the means or you're not inclined to spend money, but you still want free content to engage with and to be entertained by, unless you want YouTube to dictate for you what's going to be popular, viewers need to make some kind of effort on their own, on their own behalf. A share is huge actually helping to spread and distribute this content because we know YouTube will not do that job for us. Facebook will not do that job for us. Instagram actively gets in the way of the content that we share. These platforms are managed and cultivated and algorithmed out the wazoo. You find a new content creator and you like what they make, if you're not out there helping to spread the word on that, they probably won't last <laughs> in this day and age. This conversation right here, you know, it's like I, I, I'm trying to create a new series on real world performance testing for thousand dollar plus devices and no one's really watching. So I'm probably not going to keep it up. I'm probably going to let that slide. Why put in all of the effort and energy to make a video like that, a video series like that, if people don't seem to engage with it? And part of that's on me for having more than one topic on my YouTube channel, how dare I? But the other part of it is just it doesn't seem to resonate. So if, if folks don't care, then why expend the effort? Because really, every time I put out one of those videos and it underperforms, it hurts me on YouTube. So I, I make less ad revenue and my other videos get seen less and get shared less, so why? Why actively uh, court something that's going to harm my channel? That's the reality of what we're facing today. So, I mean, outside of just the subreddit, sharing, participating, subscribing, liking, commenting, these things really do matter. And my attempt at trying to help other people, it's growing month over month. Every month we pick up more people, we see new submissions, we see comments, we're getting more upvotes, but we still need more. Uh, reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. If you've never been, I guarantee you, you're going to find some content creators YouTube would never have sent your way, and they'll become some of your new favorite channels to watch. Uh, recommendations from people that genuinely are passionate about uh, tech and geek conversations. So one more time, reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. Please give it a uh, check it out. Please give it a view. Don't be stingy with your upvotes to help promote content. And uh, hopefully you'll also give it a share. Hopefully you enjoy it. So, um... <laughs> uh, from Two Spirits 411, I just noticed that there is no longer a Juan Bagnell backup choir, The Weed Killers. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um... Vazikos 8, Ryan Thomas finds the word gadget cringy, and I thought it's funny to share this. Um, Tech Love and Mama, I try to share an upvote when I can. I share it on my Facebook page too when I get a chance to. I love your work. Tech Love and Mama, I always appreciate it because I've seen you popping up and I've seen you sharing and I've seen you participating so much. And that kind of stuff, I mean, again, I don't always get to send out the kudos that I should, but. Um, it's it's always humongously appreciated. Oh, two spirits one one. The guys outside your window, the the leaf blowers and the uh, maintenance people. Actually, I can hear them on the opposite side of the complex. So I think they've just been getting a slightly later start over the last couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, it's been nice not having the the leaf blowers right outside this window. Um, I, I I've liked that. So uh, let's get into the gadget block. Uh, 
some Samsung, some LG, and then we've got to chat about the PlayStation 5. Um, where are we? 1025. This podcast's going to go a little long. <laughs> Uh, let's knock out Samsung and LG real quick, and then we can just save the whole tail end of this for uh, for PlayStation. Because I'm sure, especially those of you in the live chat, you have some thoughts on um, on on PlayStation Five. But first of all, this one piqued my curiosity. I uh, I am all about trying to get more mid ranger smartphone competition here in the United States. I don't think average consumers have any business shopping thousand dollar phones. I really feel like this is a terrible situation we've worked ourselves in, into here in the United States where people are grossly overbuying just so they don't feel like they're getting punished with a poor person phone. So when I hear this news from Samsung, I am very interested in a rollout plan for the Galaxy A71 5G. This is the uh, from uh, Android Authority, written up by Adamya Sharma. Samsung will soon release its cheapest 5G phone in the USA. This is a, the A71 has a Snapdragon 765 processor, a 4,500 milliamp hour battery, 25 watt fast charging, six gigs of RAM, 128 gigabytes of storage with a quad camera setup led by a 64 megapixel sensor and a 32 megapixel selfie shooter. And we're assuming that this is gonna be coming in at $599. This, I'm very interested in this. Um, 5G phones, are a super huge pain point uh, in the United States. Uh, other countries that don't have the unregulated mess of 5G that we have will find 5G prices falling faster than they're gonna fall here in the United States. So having some purpose built, even though we're calling this a mid-ranger, this used to be what the most expensive phones cost, right? $600 is no small chunk of change, but I'm feeling much better about this being a consumer price point for a nice experience if you feel you'll benefit from 5G over the next couple years. This was a major part of my OnePlus 8 commentary was it's difficult to recommend a phone unless you have some idea whether or not you might be able to jump on 5G and whether or not LTE will start to be you know, uh, sort of devalued in your region. Um, from IR 1980, IAR 1980, I listened to your podcast with Steve Litchfield earlier this morning from yesterday where you touched on the same point. I totally agree. And Pat Costin, A71 5G budget is now a mid-ranger at $600. Yeah, that's, that's where we're at now. When we have phones that can easily break $1,500, then a phone at less than half the price of that is the mid range of the smartphone market. Um, but it's a purpose built new device in this tier, as opposed to last year's LTE phone or 5G phone being sold at a reduced price. And I feel like there is a there is still value in having that kind of a comparison where I like the TCL 10 Pro and the iPhone SE for what they offer. I feel like the A71 could make a pretty good dent. And it also kind of helps validate some of my feelings on the OnePlus 8. We've got the, A50, uh, the A71 with the Snapdragon 765, uh, six gigs of RAM, 128 gigabytes of storage. A OnePlus 8 at $700 versus an a71 at $600, I feel like we're in good competition space. You know, if you want that top of the line, super horsepower premium chipset, we're talking about a $100 price delta between the two phones. Um, Mr. Pulp Fiction, we don't get a Poco phone out here. I, great. I, I love that a Poco F2 is cheap. We don't get it. And if you try to bring it here, it's not going to work on most of our carriers, or at least it won't work for 5G. So cool, I'm glad, doesn't exist. I, I can't recommend that phone to my tech savvy parents. They're not gonna play ball with a phone that they can't use on their network just because it's cheaper. <laughs> my mom is all about her next OnePlus because she loves her OnePlus 6T. <laughs> ah. And immediately following this, if we're at around $600 for uh, a Galaxy A71, 
I'm actually kind of surprised. I really didn't feel uh, that LG was going to be delivering the Velvet to the United States, but apparently it's coming. Uh, this is an article by way of Engadget, uh, written up by Steve Dent. LG's mid-range 5G Velvet uh, comes to Europe this month and to the U.S. soon. And so again, seven, the Snapdragon 765, 6 gigabytes of RAM, a 4,300 milliamp hour battery, a big old 1080p OLED. Uh, this has a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and an SD card slot for expanded storage. And uh, LG is already teasing that it does have active pen stylus support and there will be a dual screen case for it, but pricing has been a bit higher. So the equivalent price in South Korea is somewhere around $700. And this becomes a stickier conversation over, say, a OnePlus 8 or that A71. But again, I want to see purpose-built 5G-capable hardware for the United States market um, that can leverage different pros and cons. So um, let me get this out of the way here. It, so we've got like, yeah, it does say Samsung under this photo. Oh my gosh, that's hilarious, Two Spirits. This is not a Samsung, but apparently uh, the metadata on this will probably get better traffic if they put Samsung keywording into a story about LG. Who knows? Um, but I, I'll be very interested to see. We're nearing what I have to assume will be a launch for the Galaxy Note, the Galaxy Note 20. I, I'm very anxious to see will we get a Galaxy Note 20 and a Galaxy Note 20 Plus? Because the Galaxy Note 10, I don't feel was a great competitive phone. It was $950 for a 1080p display, no headphone jack, and no uh, uh, expandable storage. So if I'm comparing an active stylus driven device, and now we're into 5G territory, the LG Velvet could be a better bang for buck if you want a headphone jack, expandable storage, and an active pen stylus with pressure sensitivity and palm rejection and 5G. I'm going to be really, I mean, so like the success of the Velvet for me actually hinges on what price will a Galaxy Note 20 launch at? Because if I want this, this more fleshed out product that can expand the storage, has pen support, I can plug in headphones, I might be willing to compromise on the GPU performance and the outright you know, CPU performance to save $250, maybe $300. What do we expect a Galaxy Note 20, if we get a Note 20 and a Note 20 Plus, what do we expect a Note 20 to launch at and what compromises would we be willing to make to get a very similar experience on a competing product? Because I was telling you, like, as much as I love a OnePlus 8, if you're all about your Note and you love having a stylus, you're not going to go for a OnePlus. You're going to want another active stylus device. And here, LG might be able to scratch that itch for around two to $300 less, let alone getting the V60 on reduced costs. <laughs> Uh, Andrew Wallace, I will say that I'm even more tempted by the V60. I mean, the V60 was on sale on Verizon. So you could get the Verizon V60 for like $500. And it just it just breaks my heart because the, the phone is so good and it's getting so little acknowledgement or coverage. Um, from Pacoston, do we have a proper spec sheet on the Velvet? Can the quad DAC be hidden in the small print like the stylus support for the V60? I'm almost positive that the... Uh, that the Velvet will not have the proper ESS DAC. That being said, when I listen on the V60 in non-hi-fi mode, it is still better quality and with a louder amp than any other competing phone with a built-in headphone jack. Uh, do I still have it on the desk here? I don't think I do. Oh, no, here it is. I'm going to be putting out an audio review on the LG Stylo. With the exception of true high-res audio support. So if we're talking just listening to MP3s, the Stylo 6 
has a louder amp and can offer up competitive quality numbers against phones like the Xperia 1 Mark II. I, I mean, like again, Sony offers true high res support. So if you want the full frequency response of your 24 bit FLAC files, go Sony. If you want a louder amp and a lower noise floor, a $150 phone is competing very well for headphone users against a $1,200 Sony. So I have to believe, even if we don't get the quad DAC, the ESS DAC in the Velvet, it's still gonna be one of the best performers of the year, second only to the V60, is gonna be my prediction. I can't verify that, I don't have a Velvet, I'm feeling pretty good though about that prediction. <laughs> All right. So um, let me get this out of the way here. So JT Moat, I've, I've heard this before. Before we move on to Sony, I just I just want to I, I just want to touch on this. Um, I, JT Moat writes, I won't touch the V60 unless it's unlocked. So I understand the concerns there. I feel we're running headlong into how crazy and how mismanaged our 5G spectrum and rollout is here in the United States. For LTE enabled devices, I'd say pick up a T-Mobile variant and you should be able to deal with LTE. But the, the main issue why I don't think LG is going to put out a, a 5G phone unlocked right now is because they need to make four or five different versions of the phone. Look at OnePlus. There is an unlocked OnePlus 8. It only recently got certified for Verizon LTE. It's not going to work on Verizon 5G. It doesn't have support for UW. Uh, it will work on T-Mobile 5G, but it's not going to work on AT&T's uh, 5G rollout. So you're going to have to have a different version of the OnePlus 8 if you want to play ball with AT&T's network whenever that's accessible to consumers. And if you want 5G support on Verizon, you have to get a OnePlus 8 UW, which has changed so much that you can't use regular OnePlus 8 cases on a OnePlus 8 UW because the button layout is different. I totally get why people want unlocked phones. I totally get why LG decided not to play this this round. It, it they... A company like LG that's trying to cut costs and still maintain a portfolio of products can't afford to make four different variants of their phones where a bunch of them are just going to sit on shelves until consumers see that they can get them for like 80% off. It, that's, that's a recipe for a company to fail. So it sucks, and I totally understand why people are frustrated by that, but this is one of the situations where voting with our wallet in the dawning of 5G is going to be very critical for how we get the phones and features that we want. Otherwise, they're going to see like, oh, well, no one bought this V50. Or, I mean, no one bought the V50. No one bought this V60. I guess we should uh, cut more corners or I guess we should reduce other features or I guess we should just give up and pull the plug on LG smartphones. I mean, that's literally what we're saying at this point. So it's a it's a it's a crap choice to make that kind of a purchasing decision, but we can't we can't be upset when we have less competition, and when companies decide to start walking out of this space or reducing you know the the costs of their products by you know reducing the quality of certain aspects of their products. <laughs> From J Million NYC, the only case that works on the OnePlus 8 and OnePlus 8 5G UW is the one I got from OtterBox. I think there's one other company that's making a bumper case where, um, so like because this button layout is weird here on the side, they make one case that just has this huge scoop. <laughs> it's just this huge open area on the side of the phone and it'll fit both a regular OnePlus 8 and a OnePlus 8 UW. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a mess. It's a mess. And we should be super frustrated with carriers and with Qualcomm making this aggressive of, of a cash grab. But at the end of the day, we also just, you know, like, if you need a phone, you need a phone. <laughs> like, if you're buying a new phone this year, 
That's the reality of your market. And there are going to be a ton of consumers who it would be great if they could wait until 2022 for all this stuff to be sorted. They're not going to be able to. So we should at least be somewhat clued in onto what those options are. Someone who might keep their phone for three or four years, I'm not going to recommend they get a, a year or two year old LTE phone today. It's not a good recommendation. It really isn't. But it does mean acknowledging that costs have gone up and certain things have changed and they're going to have to do business in a way that might not be great today, but will hopefully be better tomorrow. Uh, all right, moving right along. <sighs> Who wants to talk about the PlayStation? <laughs> Uh, I am very uh, torn on PlayStation 5. Let, I mean, again, okay, let's start off with aesthetics. I love L-O-V-E capitalized exclamation point, exclamation point. I love the PlayStation 5 controller design. It looks like a couple cues cribbed from an Xbox. It's It looks like it's going to be the, the the slightly meatier grip that I like on the PlayStation 4 controller. I like the PS4 controller a lot better than the PS3 controller. And it's got that kind of edgy Tron legacy aesthetic. You know, it looks like the time travel suits from Avengers. We've seen all of these comparisons. You guys know where I'm going with this. Love the controller design. I can't say I'm a big fan of the box. <laughs> I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing a, a, an Engadget story here. This is Chris Holt looking at the PlayStation 5. But these fins and these shapes, I, I, don't, I don't think I dig it. These swoopy curves and how tall and how large. And, and like, yeah, you can set it on its side. And, you know, the, the base where the disk drive might be kind of swoops down and there's room for, you know, like a part of the shell to also keep airflow going from under the case. But there just looks like there's so much unnecessary plastic. And again, it comes down to the amount of space that these fins take up that aren't really practical. Like... This this large middle black wedge, to me, just looks like it blocks airflow that could be venting out the top of the PlayStation. For for as as Borg simple as the next Xbox is going to be, one of the things that I've loved in enthusiast computer designs, like uh, taking it to Corsair. Corsair deserves so much credit for putting out a consumer purchasable workstation grade PC that's just basically like a big thermos. And there's just a big hole on the top of that computer that just pumps air out of the system. And if you're gonna crib any kind of a design in the modern age for a box that's gonna sit behind your TV or sit under your TV, crib that design. Big giant fan hole points air up and out of system because heat rises. And then I look at this PlayStation design and it's like, well, let's, you know, the top, the top of the PlayStation, let's cover that and then put out some vents uh, that sort of diagonal cut. And then let's put some fins by those vents that won't guide airflow. It, it, it looks funky and it seems less practical. So I was super on board the controller design. I, I can't say I'm feeling the box. I, I am happy to see that there will be a disk drive version and a diskless version. I'm a uh, Vazicos 8. I'm waiting for Gamers Nexus thermal review. Huge. Okay, there's another channel. Uh, if you're into the nuts and bolts, like if you want someone to read off numbers of benchmarks for you, uh, Gamers Nexus. I, is always in my subscription feed. Love their commentary on PC building and especially uh, um, like case design. You know, looking at the thermals of these products, so good. 
So good. I, when um, when I went to my last Computex, I was actually like nerding out hard because they were there um, doing one of the overclocking challenges. I think it was at the, oh, what booth was it? I can't remember. But the whole side, I mean, it was just row after row after row of motherboards and liquid nitrogen and just like trying to trying to just jack these Intel processors as fast as they could go. Loved it. Loved it. I was, ah, I was in heaven. Um, but I am, I'm happy to see that there will still be a disc version of the PlayStation 5. As I've kind of gone through numerous streaming services, you know, I, I have a subscription to Netflix. Uh, we have, uh, we're giving Disney money with Disney Plus, but we still keep running into movies that like, we just get a, a, an itch for. Like my wife and I were talking like, hey, we just want to watch Galaxy Quest. And then we look and you're like, well, it's not on Hulu. There's a documentary about Galaxy Quest, but they're not the actual movie. And it's not on Netflix and it's not on Disney and it's not on Amazon, you know, Amazon Prime. And I don't want to buy a digital HD version. I, I mean, like, that's a movie like I just want to own forever. I, I want a beautiful 4K transfer of it and I'll rip it myself and keep it on my NOS. And I just want to have that movie i don't want it to be at the whims of some licensing decision for a streaming platform so i like increasingly while i don't watch a lot of blu-rays you know from we didn't have as big a blu-ray collection as we did a dvd collection while, while i'm not physically putting the disc it's like i want the disc as the archival i'm buying more movies on spinning plastic disc again um, and I have a computer case that still has room for a Blu-ray drive. Uh, I, I'm, I'm like keeping these as the backups. If our network goes down or, you know, <laughs> if I can't get data or if my Wi-Fi router biffs it, I can plug a disc into a box and still <laughs> watch this movie. <laughs> From Q to Rebecca, exactly the frustration of this. There's the disaster artist on Netflix, but you can't watch The Room. Ugh, drives me nuts. J Million NYC, I still buy physical medium, especially Ultra Blu-ray. So good. Two Spurs 411, I'm the same way with my Godzilla collection. Uh, you, you, you know, like there, it's not every movie, but I want the important films, the movies I care, Tombstone beautiful hd copy of tombstone the big country with gregory peck oh man i'm so glad i mean my disc got got jacked i'm so glad i did a blu-ray rip of that movie it's a four gigabyte mkv hevc file which only just now are our phones really playing ball with but that movie is so gorgeous and i i've got it in an archival quality it's not what i would stream off my nos but i can always go back it's 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 so funny, you know, like I've kind of come back to that with my music listening too. yeah, I I'd, run the jewels just came out with a new album. I paid for the wave version. Do I stream or keep the wave version on my phone? No, I listen to the m p threes, but I have the disc quality backup of that album it's it's mine forever. <laughs> Um, Rune i5, that's a very good question. Can Android read optical discs via a USB disc player? I don't know. I don't know if I still have a working external DVD drive. I'm going to have to test that because something tells me that as long as it's a standard USB I.O. driver, that Android should be able to read a DVD or a Blu-ray. I don't know. All right, I'm going to have to check that out. So anyway... Oh, Boeing Byte. This is close to our data hoarder level. Uh, yeah, I, I run, um, what am I at right now? Uh, 8, 8, 16, 20. I'm at 24 terabytes on my NAS. Um, but no, no, no. That, no. I have 16 terabytes available uh, so that I can back up. And I also do cloud. And I'm going to be looking at doing offsite with my mom. I'm going to see if I can get her to get a NAS. And I'll send her a drive. And then she'll back up to a drive on my network and I'll back up to a drive on her network so that we can still keep like our photo collections. You know, not for everything, not like full backups of everything that I have, but like my photo collection and her photo collection 
in separate locations in case anything happens, we'll at least have all of our memories backed up. So that would be for our photo, our family photos and videos, that would be a backup in quadruplicate. My NAS, my external drive, cloud, cloud, because um, I use OneDrive and Google Photos. Oh, quintuplicate if I do offsite. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm all about multiple <laughs> failure points uh, being protected. Um, sorry, let's get back to the PlayStation. So uh, PlayStation 5 and the PlayStation 5 Digital Edition, I'm glad that we're getting choices for disk drive or no disk drive. I feel like this is the last generation of consoles where games on disks are really going to be any kind of motivating purchase, but I still feel there's entertainment value to be had in keeping a, a disk drive on a living room computer. Lots of conversation. It's it's a major topic for this generation of consoles that we're getting lightning fast, solid state drives, more RAM, better support for haptic feedback, the adaptive triggers on the PlayStation 5 controller. Also kind of surprised to see Sony coming out with a PlayStation headset. Um, this was actually, I think, kind of a big deal um, looking at their audio strategy. Uh, PlayStation, I've always, one of the reasons why I lean PlayStation over uh, Xbox is actually their audio support. It's so much easier to plug different audio devices into a PlayStation than into an Xbox. Never understand why Xbox is so restrictive to USB audio IO. It makes no sense to me. Uh, like if you want a wireless gaming headset, the headsets that work on PC, a lot of them will still work on on a PlayStation. You can do funky things. Like if you want scout mode from a creative sound blaster, you can plug a creative sound blaster into a PlayStation. No, very little support or recognition on an Xbox. But getting out ahead of that, Sony is still one of like the top tier premium brands for consumer audio, wireless audio, headphones, earbuds, etc., so it's just kind of interesting. You know, they're not saying go out and buy some XM3s or these upcoming XM4s. Uh, they have a PlayStation headset that's going to look and fit in with the aesthetic of your PlayStation controller and your PlayStation Wi-Fi router. Um, that's a good... Uh, Vazikos, I'm going to say, what's the over-under? Let me put this question out there now. The one thing Sony didn't talk about in their major reveal was what the pricing was going to be. And so we've seen estimates from $499 to $700. So from like 500 to 700, roughly in the ballpark for different configurations and features. What is your over under on a PlayStation 5? So Vazikos 8 is saying about a $100 price difference for that Blu-ray drive. What, what do you think a base model digital edition PlayStation 5 is going to start at? And then we'll run through some of those comments after we get through a bit more of this, this Sony pitch. Uh, lightning speed, stunning games, breathtaking immersion, play has no limits. Uh, immediately, the number one game I was flipping out about when they um, when they started showing some of the titles that are coming to the PlayStation 5, Marvel's Spider-Man, Miles Morales. So stoked. If they can make this, if they can tie this in with um, Into the Spider-Verse and make that sort of a loose in world like there's continuity between spider-verse and the miles morales game i can't tell you so excited it, it was driving me crazy like when you played spider-man on the playstation 4 it is such a, a a beautifully polished experience of what like an open sandbox kind of game should be the fact that there are all these different licensing problems between marvel and Sony and studios and Disney had to like go and buy Fox to try and get X-Men back for the Marvel Cinema Universe. It, it was so sad to know that you have this amazing digital reconstruction of New York and you could make this like the new version of Ultimate Alliance. Like you could plug components into this ecosystem for an Iron Man game, for a Doctor Strange game. You change the game mechanics and you offer it up as like add-on packages. You know, another $30 and here's your, your storyline with Doctor Strange. Another $30 and man, the Hulk is rampaging through New York. Another $30 and here's a an espionage stealth mission with... Uh, 
I mean, sorry, stealth storyline with Hawkeye and with uh, Black Widow. So much potential that we could have just like augmented this one property with Spider-Man and we'll never get that. Like it's, that's never going to happen because of how these different companies do business with each other. Uh, you know, Boeing Bite, do a Daredevil DLC. How amazing would that be? And it's right there. Characters in continuity in the same universe who are in real New York City and just go with it. But anyway, the closest we're going to get, I'm going to flip out. I'm going to nerd out. Spider-Verse is, is an amazing movie. We even had Lex watch it, even though, you know, Peter Parker, spoilers. Um, so huge. So huge. I'm so excited for Miles Morales uh, getting his own game. But some other interesting titles, too. You know, a, a look at a future Ratchet and Clank, a new Gran Turismo, uh, Sackboy. A big adventure, a little big planet kind of uh, revival. Returnal, I'm not sure what that is, but it looks like an interesting roguelite uh, shooter. A huge, huge list of games. Of course, uh, Grand Theft Auto. We're all really excited about Grand Theft Auto V uh, coming to a PlayStation. But uh, again, uh, across the entire ecosystem, a refinement to the controller, better haptic feedback, and that's Sony's spiel. Uh, I I think a lot of us just kind of felt like the last little bit of this story didn't quite make it when they didn't tell us what the price was going to be. So uh, what, what what we've got here, let's let's run down. Uh, Matt Tyler is saying five hundred and ninety nine pounds. Uh, Punch Coon is saying six hundred dollars. Sam saying five ninety nine. Five ninety nine. Root Knight is saying 550 for the version with a disc. Suo Lin is saying 499. Uh, let's see. Who else? Two Spirits 401 saying 650. 650 for that starter vision uh, starter version. J Million saying 499 no disc, 599 with a disc. Oh, and this is a good one here. Not a Coon saying 799 Canadian. Uh, for the digital edition, eight forty nine for the Canadian version with a disc drive. I, I mean, again, I'm feeling for you folks up north. I feel like over the last couple of years, we've just been watching our Canadian neighbors get hammered on the exchange rate and for pricing on gadgets. And I would not be surprised to start seeing eight hundred dollar price tags, Canadian dollars for things like game consoles. Uh, Vazicos eight four fifty digital, five fifty disc. Um, so I, I, so largely, largely, it seems we're all kind of feeling Sony's probably going to hit us with about $100 for a Blu-ray drive. My, my guess is starter storage, whatever that might be, um, $499, $599, and then with options for each that take you up to higher tiers of storage. If you want like two terabytes of storage because they're NVMe drives. Um, you know, taking us to higher and higher price tags. Not sure what that would look like, but probably $100 increments. I actually had not considered the $50 price jump. That could be really interesting. You know, like a $499, $550 price jump between diskless and a version with a Blu-ray drive. That could actually be kind of cool. Um, I, I honestly hadn't even thought about that. I think like most people, I saw two different versions and thought $100, they're going to differentiate them with a $100 price tag. From Fat Produce, I really wish that they would stop designing consoles like people are actually going to have them set up vertically. I don't know of anyone who stores their game console vertically. It's just too easy to break and not enough home entertainment furniture supports having a game console set up vertically. Well, um, Andrew Wallace, Mr. Fat Produce, you haven't met anyone who props up their game console vertically. I would like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Juan Carlos Bagnell. I, uh, I, I produce tech reviews and tech commentary uh, on a number of different products. Uh, I focus a lot on mobile, but then I also do some work with Newegg where we talk about gaming and PC building. And uh, on my TV, we have it wall mounted which means our entertainment accessories are on a tiny little shelf that's just sort of precariously balanced behind the TV on a big swinging arm. And on that shelf, I have my, uh, my Nook, my Intel Nook, and my PlayStation 4. Both of them are propped up vertically, not horizontally, because they don't fit horizontally on that shelf behind my TV. So I just like to make your acquaintance. I am 
a person who mounts vertically. Looking at the size of the PlayStation 5, the PlayStation 5 will not fit on that shelf. <laughs> the way that the arm is situated, I measured it for the PS4. And the PS5 is going to be taller. And I know it's not going to fit. That's <laughs> so crazy. <laughs> and, and also, not a coon is saying I, I store it vertically, too. <laughs> So a DTNL, I might be the one and only person using their PlayStation 4 vertically. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I'm actually really interested in this next generation of consoles. Uh, we, we had some really brutal conversations at Newegg. Uh, this is about a year and a half ago. There was a producer there who was super into like, well, we need to be, you know, bolstering our esports commentary, and this is like high end hardware and the enthusiast sector, and we would get into it on the regular, uh, talking about game streaming. You know, we were starting to get like trickle of information on Stadia, X Cloud had always been sort of in the peripheral in the fog of Microsoft's conversations about gaming, server side was kind of an interesting idea. And it's one that could potentially impact Newegg's business model. Uh, if game streaming starts getting better, there's less incentive, not no incentive, but less incentive to start building ridiculously powerful PCs for a number of consumers out there. And I really felt like this could be a, 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 a faster change than we anticipate. Not like it's going to be overnight, you know, in 2019, no one's going to buy high-end PCs. I love how everyone, like, tries to reduce your nuance to, like, the lowest common uh, denominator argument straw man that you're trying to make. But I was saying, you know, like, we're looking at a five-year window and the 10-year window. Newegg is going to have to pivot on some of their business model. And now you start looking at things like the digital edition Xbox, the diskless versions of Xboxes and PlayStations. And I feel like this is our transition generation. Microsoft really wanted the last generation Xbox to be their transition and consumers pushed back against that. But now that we have services like, uh, um, uh, I just spaced, I, I subs I'm subscribed to it. What is Microsoft's game library? Game Pass. <laughs> um, <clears throat> with Game Pass and now with xCloud, delivering some capability for moving the game off of a box rendering that game, I'm going to be shocked if Microsoft doesn't come out with a lower end Xbox Series X, something that you know, like, if you play the game locally, yeah, you can get 1080p and 60 frames per second, sort of, sure. I mean, again, you wanna save some money, Here's a lower end device. But you know, you did buy this game. Would you want to play that game in 4K? Because if we stream it through xCloud on your cheap Xbox, we could stream the game to you in 4K. Would you be interested in that? If that is not a part of Microsoft's business model for this next series of Xboxes, I, I will be completely and totally shocked. I think Microsoft has this enormous opportunity to make games as service happen. I think they're the leading company that could pull off the Netflix of gaming and not just the game plays on another server and you stream it to your TV, but also the full catalog of games that you get for a simple subscription fee. That's really the true peanut butter jelly time. It's not just Stadia where you can stream the game remotely and you don't have to have a console. And it's not just Game Pass where you have a huge collection of games. It's both the catalog and the server side streaming. That I feel is like for however beastly powerful the next Xbox is, all these people that are like really digging into the nuts and bolts. Well, this one has an SSD and this one has teraflops and this one, the GPU and this one, the CPU and this one, the, the RAM. <clears throat> by the end of that, this console generation, I feel like those conversations will be substantially less relevant than they are today. 
I feel a ton of consumers are going to start dabbling. Just a little poke here. Maybe it's GeForce. Maybe it's an NVIDIA solution on a nice PC. Maybe Steam gets involved and starts offering up a little bit of server load for people on a subscription service. I would pay very good money monthly to Steam to have access to my entire Steam library anywhere I have a data connection. I would do that very quickly. <laughs> Shut up and take my money. So, you know, and even in like lower quality, like say I want to, you know, fire up Witcher in 720p and play it on a phone and I have my Steel Series controller, let's do it. I've got 5G in my neighborhood now. <laughs> um, yeah, let's go to town. So I, I, I think like th this is going to be that shift. And if gaming companies can put pressure on ISPs, if gamers start getting cranky about how they're content is being manipulated by carriers and ISPs. And I think it's going to be good for everybody because server side is going to be one of those turning points. Again, once we figure out gaming, low latent, low latency, real time, it becomes less precious for me to have a beastly workstation under my desk. If I could lease some server time and do my video editing on someone else's crazy hardcore server. I, I might be able to pad out a PC build for a little bit longer if I can rely on good data connectivity, good throughput, good bandwidth. I totally can't do it today because internet services suck today. But if I had gigabit, if I had gigabit up and down, I could be working on 4K video projects on someone else's server. The entire future of our, of our industry could could split on this kind of an idea. And the first place that we're going to see this in application is gaming. And now Sony, I think, is so much better at selling the box. Sony still, I mean, grossly outsells Microsoft as far as from what I've been able to see in, in terms of comparisons and sales and stuff like that. They are so good at selling the box and there are some great services on the box. But Microsoft has been all in on services and servers. And I think that's going to be the crazy awesome fight to watch go down between the PlayStation and the Xbox. <laughs> From Pat Coaston, ooh, Control is on PlayStation now. Yup. Oh man, if you haven't, if you're not playing Control, it's awesome sauce. <laughs> Hey, Matt Tyler, and this is this is a good point too. Also, download PlayStation Now on your phone, log in, and you can play without the console. Really big deal. And also the fact that it's not Sony exclusive anymore. So game streaming from your console and PlayStation Now off your console should be accessible to most decently powered Android phones at this point. <laughs> Mr. Practical, forget going back and forth on the specs. The new Xbox looks like, looks like my bathroom trash can. I'm sorry, I feel like that's still the Mac Pro. Mac Pro still wins for Darth Vader diaper genie or bathroom trash can. I, you know, I, I get what you're saying. It's, a, it's just sort of like a block. But uh, I, the fact that it's so hard-edged, I don't know. I'm just saying. West Easton on Facebook, those new controllers look so purdy. I completely agree. Um, Ruru2, tech nerds hype gigabit too much. Normies will never use that much. You're speaking to barely 1% of the market. No. As soon as you give people bandwidth, they use it. More bandwidth, and they start improving and increasing the services that they use. That happens time and time again. You give people more bandwidth, they put more devices on their networks, they stream higher quality content, whether or not they're even aware of it. And you think about the number of people that are using 4K TVs and streaming Netflix and how many of them don't really get a 4K image because they don't have the bandwidth. Whether or not they're even aware of it, their experience would improve by having better data connectivity. And now we've been shown because of the situation, how much of a reliance we should be putting on network and data infrastructure. Companies are gonna expect people to work from home and a number of families and a number of communities in this country won't really have great access to those telecommunications tools at their homes. They will be less relevant to the 21st century. And the fact that you could go to Chattanooga, Tennessee and get 300 meg down, 300 meg up for less than half of what I'm paying for 300 meg down, 20 meg up, 
makes me want to throw up in my mouth a little bit. This is a completely spurious argument from the telecommunications industry. They've been saying this for years. Well, when consumers tell us that they need more bandwidth, we'll be happy to give them more backhaul and light up more fiber. We've been saying it. I it hasn't happened. It doesn't happen. I've been stuck at two to 300 down and 20 up for eight years now. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter who says they want this or the the number of people I've seen showing up at town hall meetings and uh, community meetings and the L.A. City Council. I, I mean, we're now seven years into our five year examination on the business impacts of fiber to home. And the L.A. City Council still hasn't budged. We, we, we haven't come up with a, a conclusion on whether or not more data would be better for people in residential neighborhoods. We were going to do that in five years. It's taken us seven. Who knows? No way to know. No, we're, 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 we're putting a pin in that. Sorry. Every service improves. Education improves. Healthcare improves. Infrastructure improves. And communities become more relevant to businesses in the 21st century. More bandwidth is necessary. 5G won't get it done. Our, our electrical grid needs help. The only solution for all of those considerations, work from home, school from home, homeschooling, uh, medical from home, is fiber to home. That's it. The only way this is going to get done. All right. I think that's probably <laughs> Boeing Bite. Who doesn't want one at 4K UHD HDR? I don't. <laughs> like I said, I've got psoriasis. Terrible skin. You guys want to stream me in 720. <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> west easton called the new egg it team i'm sure they'll fix it up good <laughs> got another shoot with new egg this week and i'm going to be shooting out of my home office so i'm i'm hoping that goes that goes smoothly all right folks i uh, probably about time we wrap this up i uh, thank you for going with me on a really politics heavy um ooh. <laughs> Fat produce. I want to see. I want to be able to see Juan's individual mustache hairs. <laughs> you don't want to see this in 4K. I, I mean, I put my videos out in 4K. I don't know why I'm being this sensitive to it, but the live streams, I'm maybe not quite as cleaned up as I should be. Um. <laughs> uh. Yes. Wrapping this up. Thank you so much for going with me on a on a political journey at the first half of this podcast. Some very important stories that. These affect your daily tech consumerism. I, I mean, like, I, can't, I can't show you clearer examples of how being engaged in these conversations matters. And I, I don't think I can point to clearer examples of how this isn't, I'm, obviously I'm a very left-leaning individual, but how these stories aren't Democrat or Republican focused. We need to be those resources in our family, in our friends, in our social circles, and in our communities providing context and sharing good information on what happens when multi-billion dollar corporations get to overly influence the political process and we don't get a say in how this stuff is managed. We need to have a say in how this stuff is managed. We'll always disagree on what the final outcome, on what the regulation should look like, but it's we're long overdue agreeing that there's a problem. We should be able to agree that there's a problem and then have a grown-up conversation of, of compromises on what the solution should be. That's the only way our society survives the 21st century. And I, I feel well, we're in good company for having these types of conversations when I see a live chat like this who's fired up and who I, not everyone agrees with me, but we're, we're still with civility replying to each other with different pros and cons and, uh, and, and different ideas on what the outcome should be. The flip side of that is also I'm getting real stoked for how I play games. And I feel like an interesting sea change could happen in a very techie geeky kind of way. 
and and the the first clues on this seeing some of what sony and microsoft are working on and knowing that there are other players like apple and nvidia and uh, valve that are also working on things that could be really interesting you know, not a lot really shakes up that gamer relationship between games and services and spinning discs and how controllers work. I think we're starting to see some of that rubber band stretch where progress could happen really quickly. I don't know that it will, but it could. And that kind of potential is is really exciting. So. Um, thanks so much for uh, for tuning in, for hanging out, and for joining the live chat. Sharing this show is greatly appreciated. If you're catching the audio version, or you know, even if you're not listening to the audio versions of the podcast, if you're inclined to, on all of the various podcasting platforms like Apple and Google and Spotify, I don't get any money from Spotify, but I'm on Spotify. Uh, reviews, really, really appreciated. Super hugely appreciated for this little homegrown podcast that we bring to you week after week after week. This is episode 156. This podcast survived my tenure at Pocket Now and is back in your hands for us to have these long form geeky conversations. So folks, I want you to have a phenomenal week. I want you to do awesome with your technology. I want you to be awesome with your technology. And, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, I want you all to keep being those good tech neighbors, those good tech citizens to help your family and friends out because resources online are getting more difficult to chew through and you probably have the information in your brain to help them with a purchasing decision or with tech support. You're doing noble work if you're out there helping your family and friends. I will catch you back here next week on another uh, episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show. Be safe. Don't take any dumb risks. Try and see some family if you can. It was very refreshing for us. But I want to see all these names back here next week safe and happy and healthy. Take care. I love you all. Be well.